The Snow Queen. Gerda was a young girl who lived with her grandma. Her fiance lived next door. His name was Kay. Between Gerda's house and Kay's, there was a small walkway. Gerda and Kay planted red roses there, as a symbol of their eternal love. They always talked about getting married. Then, on Winter's Day, they were sitting beside their rose bush when Gerda's grandma cried. Look, the Snow Queen is gathering her flakes. Gerda and Kay rushed to the window. Kay looked at the Snow Queen through the window and stuck out his tongue. Don't do that, Kay. What if she sees you? She might come after you. Then he climbed through the window and back to his bedroom, which was in his house, which was right next to Gerda's house. That night, Kay was getting ready for bed. He walks towards his window and peers out. He spots a unique-looking snowflake and finds that it's rapidly growing larger and larger, until it became the Snow Queen. She held in her hand a plate of sweets called Turkish delights. Kay couldn't resist. He snatched a handful from the plate. As he shoved them greedily into his mouth, the lady grabbed his wrist and pulled him out of the window and onto her sled. Her team of horses suddenly took off. Kay should have been very frightened, but the sweets had dulled his sense of discernment and alarm. The next morning, when Gerda came to visit Kay, he wasn't there. She looked everywhere for him. She raced down to the village square and she cried, "Have you seen Kay? Have you seen my Kay?" But no one had seen him. Nobody knew where he had gone. Don't let my Kay be dead. Please don't let my Kay be dead. I don't believe he is. Gerda looked up, and there sat a little sparrow. When we're searching for the food we set high on the rooftops, we see everything. We would have seen him unless he fell in the river. I'll go and ask the river fairy. A tiny spark of hope lit up in Gerda's heart. If he drowned, the river fairy will know. So, she went near the river and shouted, "River, river, did my Kay come by here?" Did he fall in your deep waters and drown? And the river fairy came up from the water with a sweet smile on her face and said, "Oh, my sweet child, no, your Kay didn't come down here. Now don't cry. Where is he then? I wish I knew. But there is an old witch who lives beside my shore. She might be generous to you, but you have to be cautious about her." I will do anything for my love. Can you please take me there? Why not? Just hop in that little boat. My streams will lead you to the witch's cottage. The river fairy then disappeared, and Gerda hopped into the boat. The little boat floated on, with the current getting faster and faster. Then Gerda saw a small cottage. An old lady came hobbling outside. She was bent over and carrying a walking stick. The old woman walked to the edge of the river, caught the boat with her walking stick, and drew it into the land. She helped Gerda out. Although Gerda was afraid of this strange old witch, she was totally determined to find Kay again. Come and tell me who you are. Gerda told her everything. Have you seen my Kay? No, but perhaps he might come by. They went inside the cottage. There was a bowl of beautiful cherries on the table. Don't be sad now, Gerda. Your love will find a way to you. Now, eat those cherries. While Gerda was eating, the old woman combed her long hair with a golden comb. As she combed, she whispered, "I have longed for a granddaughter like you." 
Gerda, forgot about Kay, because the old woman had cast a spell on her through the magic comb. The old witch wanted to keep Gerda as her own. After a while, Gerda murmured, I will stay here forever. But one day, while in the garden, Gerda noticed the red roses. They reminded her of Kay. The memory of Kay broke the old woman's spell, and Gerda raced to the garden gate. She ran till she could run no longer and stopped at the stone bridge. Suddenly, she was surrounded by trolls. Trolls rushed forward, seizing Gerda. She is fat and pretty, and she has been fed on nuts and honey. How nice she will taste. She shall play with me. She shall give me her muff and her pretty dress. The little girl troll, who was about the same age as Gerda, wore a mournful look on her face. She clasped little Gerda around the waist and said, They shall not kill you. I will protect you. All the trolls laughed and agreed to give Gerda the little troll. Gerda explained her story to her, how fond she was of Kay, how she must find him. After they ate and drank, they were walking below the stone bridge. Above them, more than a hundred pigeons, who pretended to be asleep, watched and listened to them. We have seen Kay. Where? In the carriage of the Snow Queen. Where were they going? Lapland. The Snow Queen has a castle there. Little Girl Troll looked serious, nodded her head, and said, I'll help you to get your love. The Little Girl Troll went near to her pet, the reindeer, squinted her eyes, and said, I will untie your cord. You shall run fast and carry this sweet girl to the castle of the Snow Queen. Help her find her Kay. Then the little troll girl cut the string of the reindeer, and away Gerda and reindeer flew. He ran on until he reached the Snow Queen's castle. There he set Gerda down. You must go on alone from here. I will be here when you come back. I will make sure you and your love will get home safely. Gerda walks there outside the tall ice castle of the Snow Queen. She was suddenly surrounded by thousands of snowflakes that fluttered about her. They were the Snow Queen's guards. Gerda prayed. The cold was so great, she could see her own breath. It poured like steam from her mouth. As she continued to pray, the steam appeared to increase until it took the shape of little angels. By the time Gerda had finished her prayers, a whole legion stood around her. They attacked snowflakes, and the battle began. Gerda hastened onward to the Snow Queen's castle, and she found Kay deep within its icy walls. Kay, my Kay, I have found you at last! Kay was almost frosted over and blue from head to toe, for he had become so addicted to Turkish delight, he no longer felt anything else at all. All this time, the Snow Queen had fed him that sweet, sinister, and powerful spell. Gerda hugged him and wept hot tears that fell on his chest and penetrated his heart. They melted the ice, which had become Kay's heart. Warmth returned to his body. He recognized Gerda and cried joyfully. Gerda, where have you been all this time? Kay, I was looking for you, my love. I found you at last. They clung together, laughing and weeping for joy. The loyal reindeer was waiting for them. Upon seeing them approach, he knelt down and allowed them to climb upon his back. They flew home with joy and gratitude dancing in their eyes. Soon after, they got married and lived happily ever after. The End 
The Little Mermaid A long time ago, there was a city under the sea named Atlantis. King Orin ruled and had one daughter. She was pretty. Not only was she beautiful, but the Little Mermaid could sing beautifully. Mermaids were not allowed to go up to the surface to see the world of humans until they were 20 years old. Each year, the Little Mermaid would plead with her father to be allowed to travel to the water's surface. Be patient, little one. Your turn will come. At long last, it was the Little Mermaid's 20th birthday. Towards the end of the day, her father turned to her and said, The time has come, my sweet child. Go to the surface of the sea and come back to tell us what you find. But be safe and stay away from humans. The Little Mermaid kissed her father, said goodbye, and began the long swim upwards to the surface. It was nighttime before she arrived at her destination. She saw a ship lit by hundreds of glowing lanterns. So she swam closer to the ship. And upon hearing strange and wonderful music, she just had to find out how these sounds were made. Looking through a window in the side of the ship, she saw what appeared to be a birthday party going on on the ship's lower floor and it seemed that it was for a young prince. He was the most handsome creature that the mermaid had ever seen, and it didn't take much for the gullible young maiden to fall in love. After a while, It's getting late. I must head home. She was about to dive, but suddenly there was a strange sound which she had never heard before. A storm. The prince's ship started to lurch and roll in the churning sea, and there were screams of terror as the sailors tried to save their ship from the giant waves. Then swiftly, the ship rammed on the sea stone and broke in two. Many lives were thrown into the sea along with the prince. The little mermaid knew that humans could not survive underwater. No, I will not let my love drown. So she carried Prince back up to land, where she tended to his wounds throughout the night. The Prince was unconscious upon arrival to the sea's shore. So the mermaid laid the sleeping Prince on the sand in front of a small church and cried for help. Then she swam to some nearby rocks to see if someone would come to his aid. The Prince opened his eyes and saw a girl coming out of the church. When the girl saw him, she quickly ran back into the church to fetch some help. People came running. The prince was picked up and gently carried away. The little mermaid then swam back to her home. For days, she sat sadly by herself. But the little mermaid could not forget the prince. So she devised a foolish plan to swim off and be with the stranger whom she had given her heart to. The next day, the Little Mermaid called for their royal advisor, Sebastian the Crab. He soon came to see the Little Mermaid and said, Princess, how can I help you? Take me to Ursula the Sea Witch. Sebastian yelped in surprise and exclaimed, <laughs> Don't you know who she is? She is an evil witch. Why? Then... She told Sebastian the whole story of the storm, along with her plan to be with the prince. After a brief argument, Sebastian foolishly agreed to take her to Ursula. The sea witch lived in the darkest, coldest part of the ocean, and her house, which was made from the bones of drowned sailors, was guarded by poisonous water snakes. As the Little Mermaid and Sebastian enter Ursula's lair, the Sea Witch stood in front of her crystal ball, gazing into it and smiling fiendishly. Ursula, I have come to 
Oh, my sweet little princess, I know why you have come. You want to marry a prince whom you've never met. You wish to lose your fish's tail. Fear not. I've got a potion which won't fail. So you can help me? My sweet child, that's what I do. It's what I live for. I can vanish your tail. But it will hurt, too. Just tell me what I have to do. Ursula snatched a dark-hued potion from her pantry with her tentacles. With this potion, you will be in two-legged motion. Give me the potion. Ursula smiled eerily and said, No, 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 no. To get the potion, I have one condition. Nothing comes for free. First, you pay me. But I have nothing. I'm only a princess with unlimited wealth. How can I pay? Your beautiful voice is what I need. Then you will be human indeed. Only three days you have. Remember this. The prince should fall for you and give you a kiss. Once you get your kiss, you will always be human, enjoying bliss. But if you fail to follow my tone, you will be sea foam. Very well. If that is what I must pay. The witch handed the little mermaid the potion, and her voice left her. The next day, the prince's servants found a beautiful young woman lying on the beach near the palace. They helped her inside, and when she walked, she seemed to be in great pain, as if she were walking on knives. The servants dressed her in fine clothes, and the prince came to see her. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. What's your name? But she kept her silence, as this was the little mermaid. Although she didn't speak, she quickly became the prince's favorite. He never went anywhere without the little mermaid at his side. Before long, the prince told her how much he cared for her, and she thought her heart would burst. But I can't marry you because I'm still searching for my true love. He explained about the storm and a beautiful girl rescuing him and how, after only getting a glimpse of her, had fallen in love with her, deciding that if he ever found her, he would marry her. The little mermaid was very sad, for she couldn't tell the prince that she was that girl, that she had given up everything, her tail, her voice, her family, just to be with him. On the second day, a king from another land visited the prince. The king brought with him his beautiful daughter, and when the prince saw the king's daughter, he recognized her. This was the girl who had found him on the beach. So he asked her to marry him, and she agreed. On the third day, the little mermaid thought her heart would break, for it was the same day her prince would marry the other princess. And when the sun set, she would die, just like she had agreed to with the sea witch. The wedding was to be held on the ship. So, with a heavy heart, she attends, just so she can see the prince one last time. Earlier that day, the Little Mermaid's parents visited Ursula and threatened her. The cruel sea witch gave them a knife explaining that if their daughter would plunge that knife into the heart of the prince, her spell would be broken. As the marriage was well underway, she went on the ship's deck to cry. And there, she saw her father and mother came upon water. They were sad. What have you done, my child? Her mother was crying. Quick, you can still save yourself. The witch has given us this magic dagger. Kill the prince, for when his blood splashes on your feet, it will grow into a tail, and you will become a mermaid again. Hurry, the sun is nearly rising. 
After her parents left, she ran towards the prince with the knife. She looked at him as he was happy beside his new wife. One blow with the knife, and then she would be free. She looked at the sharp dagger, then at the prince. She still loved him, so she went to the deck again and threw the knife far out into the sea. In the morning, the prince ordered his servants to search high and low, but no sign of the little mermaid was ever found. The prince was very sad and would often sit on the beach late at night, missing his little friend. And sometimes he would look at the bubbles on the water shining in the moonlight and was almost certain that he could see her face. The End The Tale of Tom Thumb Once, there was a very old beggar who was wandering through the densely wooded forest. One day, when his feet were very sore, he knocked on the door of a one-eyed orc named Gogo and begged for a bite to eat. The orc, Gogo, and his wife, Gigi, welcomed the stranger into their cave. While his wife put some bread on a small plate, they realized that their guest was none other than Merlin, the greatest and most skillful wizard of all the realms. Oh, great Merlin, please accept our humble assistance. You both are very humble and generous. I am well pleased. Therefore, I wish to offer you anything you desire. He snapped his fingers twice, and then bubbles appeared above his head with images in them. Ah, the skadoosh! Shiny heaps of gold, sparkling diamond mines. Tell me, what do you wish for? Oh, I should be the happiest creature in the world if I had a son. Even if he was no bigger than my husband's thumb, I would be satisfied. Gigi gazed at her thumb in wistful longing. Merlin was so amused with the idea of an orc boy, no bigger than a thumb, that he decided to grant the poor woman's wish. And poof, there came a sweet little orc boy holding Gigi's thumb. The new orc parents felt utter happiness, and they thanked Merlin countless times. Soon after, the wizard departed from his humble host's dwelling. Tom never grew any larger than his father's thumb. That's why everyone called him Tom Thumb. Gogo and Gigi never let their very tiny son disappear from their sight for fear of losing him. They crafted a small toy house for him to live in. And as he got older, he became a very cunning and clever lad. One day, Gogo was getting ready to go into the forest to cut wood. He said to himself, I wish I had someone to drive the cart to me. Father, I can bring the cart all by myself. Gogo laughed and he answered, <laughs> Well, let's at least try. When the time came, Tom asked his mother to harness the horse to the cart. And then he sat in the horse's ear and gave him directions. So the horse went the correct way through the densely wooded forest. It happened that as they turned a corner, Tom was calling out. Gently, gently. Two humans responded to his cry of distress. One of them saw the horse and heard the voice, but couldn't see the rider. What an odd thing that is. There goes a cart, and the rider is talking to the horse. But still, the rider is not to be seen. They started to follow the cart out of curiosity, wondering what sort of strange magic this was. The cart drove directly into the forest, and exactly to the place where Gogo was working. Then Tom, seeing his father, called out to him. 
Do you see, Dad? I have arrived with the cart. Gogo took his son and put the boy onto his shoulder. The two strangers were looking upward all this time and did not know what to say, as they were simply flabbergasted. Then one of them rattled the other by the shoulders, saying with greedy excitement, "We must steal the little orc. He would make our fortune." People from all over would pay to see a little freak like him. We'd be rich, rich, I tell you. So, they hastily disguised themselves by covering with branches and leaves. When Gogo was taking a shortcut through the woods, they gingerly grabbed Tom by putting a hand over his tiny mouth and swiftly stuffing him inside their satchel. And just like that, they slipped away, cloaked in the shadows of the tall pines of the forest. Help, Dad! Help me! Tom was shouting, but no one could hear him. The two strange kidnappers journeyed onward till dusk had begun to fall, and Tom requested with urgency in his voice. Will, will you please set me down? I need to go to the bathroom. Don't you fool us, piggy boy. We know you just want to escape and run away, right? No, sir. But if you doubt me, then I suggest you tie me with a thread. They agreed to bind the boy in a thread, with one end tied to Tom and the other tied to the human's hand. They released him. And allowed him to relieve himself. Tom nimbly slipped into a mouse hole and cut the thread with his strong teeth. The men stuck their sticks into the hole, but it was all in vain because Tom crept still farther into the hole. As it became darker and darker, they were forced to give up in frustration. After a while, when Tom realized that his kidnappers were gone, he crept out of the hole. As he was walking, he heard two goblins chatting together about how to rob his father, Gogo. He then came out from the shell and disrupted their scheming with cunning cleverness. I could tell you how. I can slip through the door of the cave, then into the safe, and I can get you as much gold as you want. What do you say? <laughs> and why would you help us out like that? Hmm. What's in it for you, you little thing? I would get my fair share of the loot, of course. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's go then. Goblin carries Tom atop his head, and off they went. As they approach Gogo's cave. Tom slipped through a tiny little crack in the cave and opened the door for them by pulling a small lever that his father had specially made for Tom. The two goblins entered the cave, their eyes gleaming with the glitter of greediness. They double-checked to make sure that the orc couple were sleeping and proceeded to stealthily traverse to the treasury room. As the goblins began to selfishly stuff gold into their satchel, Tom closed the treasure room door by pulling yet another lever, trapping them inside. He called out, "Dad, Dad, come here! I have captured robbers!" Both Gogo and Gigi wake up, with a smile dancing across their faces as they hear their son, and run towards the sound of his sweet voice. My little Tom has returned. The whole family cried tears of gratitude and joy at the reunion of their family, as well as the safety of their belongings. Gigi then picked up her son Tom and kissed him. Soon, they heard the whispering of the two would have been thieving goblins from the treasure room. <laughs> hey, Tom boy, come on, open the door. Your share of the treasure is here, just waiting for you. Um, Tom, you there? Can you hear me now? The whole orc family laughed at their intruder's predicament, and then Gogo went to teach them a lesson and beat them good and hard. 
Soon, Tom could hear the goblins crying for mercy and in fear of their lives. When Gogo finally emerged from out of the treasury room, two goblins were swinging upside down in his tightly fisted grasp. And Tom felt so very proud to be the son of such awe-inspiring parents. From now on, we will treat you as the orc treat another. I am proud of you, my son. The End The Magic Grinder Long, long ago, in Egypt, there was a poor maiden named Naur. She worked for a greedy lord by the name of Anubis. While he sat in the shade all day, Naur and her nephews worked in the garden. Naur picked fruits and vegetables, while Ra and Seth pulled and cut the weeds. At the end of each day, they brought their basket of food to Lord Anubis and he would put the heavy basket on the scale. Hmm, not bad. But whenever Naur asked for her pay, he always shouted, Come back tomorrow. So Naur had no money. Without money, she could not buy food for her nephews. One day, she went to the cupboard, and it was empty. I will go and ask Lord Anubis for some food. Nower went straight to the Lord's house. He came to the door himself, rather than one of his servants. What do you want? I'm a very busy man. Nower peeked into his dining room. When she saw the delicious food, she was hungrier than ever. I only want a little food. My nephews are very hungry. Food? I don't have enough for myself. He lied. Go away. Poor Nower, away she went, without food for herself or her nephews. On her way home, Nower had to pass a cave. Suddenly, she heard a strange moaning and groaning. It was coming from inside. I wonder what that could be. It sounds like someone is hurt. It was a serpapard, stuck under some stones and hollering loudly in pain. Nower was afraid at first, but after listening to his cries for help for a while, she felt pity and was no longer afraid. So she called to the serpapard. What can I do to help you? These rocks are too heavy for me to pick up. The serpapard pointed to a shelf in the corner. It was filled with beautiful treasures. Take down the golden grinder and bring it here to me. Nower handed the grinder to him. Watch and listen. He began to turn the handle. As he turned, he said, Golden Grinder, help me, please. You will know just what I need. As soon as he said those magic words, a shovel was standing beside him. All by itself, it began to dig. It lifted the heavy rock. Suddenly, another shovel appeared. It started digging, too. Then came another shovel, and another, and another. After some time, all the shovels completed their work. The serpapard said, Golden Grinder, stop and stay. The grinder stopped making shovels. At last, the serpapard was free once again. Because you have helped me. I'm going to give you this magic grinder. Just say the magic words, and it will give you anything you want. Oh, thank you. The serpapard waved goodbye to Nower. Now don't forget the magic words to make the grinder stop. <laughs> it won't stop.
unless you say those exact words. I won't forget them. Away she ran to show her nephews the wonderful magic grinder. When her nephews saw the grinder, they were not very happy. Where is our food, Aunt Nower? We will have food. Listen. Nower began to turn the handle. Golden Grinder, help me please. You will know just what I need. Suddenly, the table was covered with food. There were turkey and ham, mashed potatoes, peas and carrots, fruit and cheese and milk and bread. Then, Nower said, Golden Grinder, stop and stay. The Grinder stopped making food. Then, Ra cried, Oh, Auntie, let's ask for new clothes. Nower said the magic words, Presto! There were dressed in fine new clothes. Then Seth said, Let's ask for new furniture. When Nower turned the handle and said the magic words, the grinder gave them fine new furniture. Then Ra and Seth cried together, We are rich! They bounced up and down on their new bed. Just remember, never tell anyone the magic words. Next morning, Nower and her nephews did not go to work in Lord Anubis' garden. Nower stayed home to plant some flowers. Seth and Ra went fishing at the stream. Lord Anubis soon came to visit and find out why Nower and her nephews had not come to work for him that day. He was surprised to see their new things. He cried in surprise. All of this can't be yours. Where did you get everything? It's a secret. I can't tell you. If you don't tell me, I will go to the king. He will throw you into the jail for stealing. Nower showed the grinder to him. I did not steal anything. This grinder gives me whatever I want. Lord Anubis snatched it away from her. I'll take care of that for you. And he ran straight home. He put it down and turned the handle and said, I want some gold, please. Nothing happened. Then he shouted angrily, I want gold now. Still, nothing happened. Then he said, I will find out how to make it obey me. Off he ran to find Nower's nephews. As for Nower and her nephews, they never went to work for Lord Anubis again. Nower sewed in her own shady garden. Seth and Ra spent their time fishing, and the magic grinder gave them everything they needed to live happily ever after. Lord Anubis found Seth and Ra fishing at the stream. My dear fellows, I hear you have a grinder that gives you anything you want. Tell me, how does this magic grinder work? It's easy. You just you just say, Golden Grinder, help me please. You know just what I need. And out comes whatever you want. Seth quickly poked his brother. He whispered, That's a secret. Ra did not say another word. Very interesting. Now he knew how to make the grinder work. He ran towards his ship to flee from the village so that no one can take his magical grinder. He could hardly wait to try it again. So he began to turn the handle into the sea. I should test it first. For now, I'll ask for a little salt. In his greediest voice, he said, Golden Grinder, help me, please. You know just what I need. Sure enough, the grinder began to make salt. Then it made more salt. Now his boat was filled with salt, and it became so heavy, so he cried. Stop it! Stop it, oh grinder! Hey, stop now! But he did not know the magical words, so the grinder did not stop. Soon, his ship started sinking because of the weight, 
And finally, the ship and Anubis drowned in the water. But children, do you know that magical grinder is still running and making salt? And that is why seawater is so salty. The End The Snake Prince Once upon a time, there was an old woman who lived by herself in a city in India. She was very poor. One day, she went down to the river as usual to wash, taking with her a small brass pot, which she used to carry water back to her hut. But when she lifted the lid off to fill it, there was a glittering, deadly snake inside. She thought, I will take this snake home with me and let it kill me there, for I am so poor and alone and I long for death. When she reached her hut, she tipped the pot on the floor. But to her surprise, instead of the snake, a magnificent necklace fell out. She picked it up and hurried to the palace to offer it to the king. When the king saw the necklace, he bought it from the old woman at once to give it to his queen, whose days were filled with sadness because she had no children. The queen was delighted with the beautiful necklace and locked it away in her jewel chest. Sometime later, she wanted to look at it again. But when she opened the door, she found to her amazement that the necklace had disappeared and in its place was a baby boy who sat on a silk cushion smiling and beaming happily at her. Oh, how sweet! I've always longed for a baby. This child is the loveliest jewel more than any necklace that's ever been made. The years went by and the boy grew into a young man whose beauty and wisdom were praised by all. His parents started looking for a bride for their son. And eventually, it was arranged that he should marry a beautiful princess from the neighboring state. Now, the old woman, who had sold the necklace to the king, had been given the position of a nurse to the young prince. She loved the void dearly, and in her foolish pride, she could not help boasting a little to the other servants that there had been magic in his birth. This rumor spread, and it reached to the ears of the prince's bride. Filled with curiosity, she resolved to find out the secret as soon as she became his wife. The prince spoke tenderly to his bride, but she did not answer him. She was silent for a long time while the prince pleaded with her to speak. At last she said, Tell me the story of your birth, my prince. The prince was filled with dismay at her request. If I tell you, you will be sorry that you ever asked this question. For many months, their lives continued this way, each one growing sadder and paler because of the secret that lay between them. At last, the prince could bear it no longer and said to his bride, <sighs> At midnight tonight, I promise to tell you my secret but you will regret it all your life. The princess was so happy to hear this that she paid no heed to his warning. That night, the prince ordered his horses to be saddled, and little before midnight, he rode with his princess down the river. By its bank, he stopped and asked in his infinitely sad voice, Do you still wish me to tell you my secret? Yes! Then I will tell you. I am the son of a king of a far country, but by an evil spell I was turned into a snake. No sooner had he spoken the last word than he sank to the ground and disappeared. The princess heard a rustle and saw in the moonlight a snake gliding into the river. She called to her love to return and searched everywhere for him. But the night held its secret, and her prince did not return. 
When the king and the queen found her in the morning, she was weeping, and her long hair was flowing loose. Her feet were cut and bleeding from the stones that she had stumbled on in the night. All she asked was that they build a temple of black stones on the river bank, where she would live alone and moan for her prince. Years passed, and still the princess waited for her husband to return. She never left the temple, and the guards who watched her never allowed anyone to come inside. Then one morning, when she awoke, she found a stain of fresh mud on the pillow beside her. She asked the guards if anyone had entered the room while she was asleep, but they had seen no one. The third night, the princess determined to stay awake and watch, so she cut her finger with a knife so that the pain would keep her from sleeping. At midnight, she saw a snake come gliding along the floor with mud from the river still clinging on to its skin. It came up to her bed, raised its head, and then sank down on the pillow beside her. Who are you and what do you want? I am your prince, your husband, and I have come to see you again. The princess began to weep, and as he watched her, the snake went down. At last, didn't I tell you that you would repent your curiosity all your life? Oh, yes, I have repented it all these years and I have been alone, Prince. Is there nothing I can do to bring you back again? S yes, there is one thing. If you are brave enough to do it, you must put a bowl of milk and honey in each of the corner of this room. All the snakes of the rivers will come and drink the milk and the one that leads the way will be the queen of the snakes. You must stand in front of her and say, Oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, Give me back my husband. But if you are frightened and do not stop her, she will keep me in her power forever. And you will never see me again. With these words, the snake glided away and disappeared into the river. The following night, the princess took four bowls of milk and put one in each corner of the room. She stood in the doorway, waiting. At midnight, there was a great hissing and rustling from the river, and presently, the ground was covered with the writhing forms of snakes. Their eyes glittering, and their forked tongues quivering, and reached forward as they moved towards the princess. They were led by the huge, hideous creature who was the queen of the snakes. The guards were so frightened that they ran away and left the princess alone standing in the doorway. She was deadly white, but determined that she would not run away. When the leading snake came within reach of her, she cried, Oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, give me back my husband, please. But the queen of snakes moved forward until her head was almost touching and her small, evil eyes seemed to flash fire. Still, the princess stood in the doorway and again she cried, Oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, give me my husband, please. Then the snake fell back and hissed. S tomorrow you shall have him. S when she heard these words, the princess sank fainting into her bed. 
The next morning, the princess took off her mourning dress and put on beautiful clothes again. She filled the temple with flowers, and when night came, she lit the garden with lanterns and the temple with candles. At midnight, the prince came to her from out of the river. She ran to meet him, and they embraced with greater joy and love than they had ever felt before. The old king and queen wept with joy too, and commanded that feasting and rejoicing begin. The old woman, who had been the prince's nurse, was far too old to do anything for the children, but loved them. And the prince and the princess ruled the land for many years with love and wisdom in their hearts. The end. The Magic Ring. A wealthy father gave his son three hundred gold coins and sent him off to journey the world in search of finding a trade for his unique skills. Robin, for that was the son's name, took the money and said farewell to his father. He had not gotten very far when he came across some herdsmen quarreling over a dog that some of them wished to kill. Please do not kill the dog. I will give you one hundred gold coins for it. Pleaded the young fellow. Then and there, the bargain was struck, and the foolish young man took the dog and continued on his way. It was not long after that he met up with some folks fighting about a cat. Some of them wanted to kill it, but others did not. Oh, please do not kill it! I will give you one hundred gold coins for it. Of course, they at once gave him the cat and took the money. He went on till he reached a village where some folk were quarreling over a snake that had just been caught. Some of them wished to kill it, but others did not. Please do not kill the snake. I will give you one hundred gold coins for it. Of course, the people agreed and were highly delighted. Upon becoming the proud new owner of a snake, a dog, and cat, Robin went home. You fool! You scamp! Exclaimed his father when he had heard how his son had wasted all the money that had been given to him. Go and live in the stables and repent of your folly. You shall never again enter my house. So the young man went and lived in the stables. His companions were the dog, the cat, and the snake. These creatures grew very fond of him. One day, the snake, in course of conversation, said to its master. I am the son of King Basilisk. One day, when I had come out of the ground to drink the air, some people seized me and would have killed me had you not most opportunely arrived at my rescue. How glad my father would be to see his son be rescued! Where does he live? I should like to see him, if possible. Well said. Do you see Mount Olympus? At the bottom of that mountain, there is a sacred spring well. If you come with me and dive into that spring, we shall both reach my father's country. Oh, he will wish to reward you too. However, if he asks what you would like, you would reply, "The ring on your right hand and the famous pot and spoon which you possess. With these in your possession, you would never need anything, for the ring is magical." You would have to speak to it, and immediately a beautifully furnished mansion will be provided for you, and the pot and the spoon will supply you with all manner of the rarest and most delicious foods. Attended by his three critter companions, the man walked to the well and prepared to jump in, according to the snake's directions. He ordered his dog and cat to stay behind and protect the entrance. The young man and the snake reached their destination in safety, and information of their arrival was sent to the king basilisk. Then the king went and embraced his son, and saluting the stranger, welcomed him to his dominions. Welcome to the land of serpents, young man. You saved my son's life, and I am so much thankful for that. Now your wish is my command. Please ask anything, and I will provide that to you in an instant. Thank you, King Basilisk, but I do not want anything in exchange. It is a wise man's duty to save the poor soul if he saw one in trouble. 
You are not only kind, but gentlemanly also. It is my request. You should stay here for several days. The young man stayed there for a few days, during which he received the king's right-hand ring, and the pot and spoon, in recognition of his highness's gratitude to him for having delivered his son. He then returned. On reaching the top of the spring, he found his friends, the dog and the cat, waiting for him. Afterward, they walked together to the riverside, where it was decided to try the powers of the charmed ring and pot and spoon. The merchant's son spoke to the ring, and immediately a beautiful house and a lovely princess with golden hair appeared. He soon got married to the princess. They all together established their own kingdom, where people were never hungry because of the magical pot and spoon. Time and again he used his magical ring and helped others in his kingdom, and they lived very happily ever after. With only 300 gold coins, which he spends to save his friend's life, he gets tons of happiness and wealth in return. So kids, the moral of this story is good deeds always pay handsomely. The End The Magic Little Pencil Noah got off his school bus and stepped out on the street in the little town in which he lived. He never imagined that this would be the weirdest day of his life. He was walking on a crosswalk when he saw an old man shivering from the cold and looking very hungry and begging politely for food. P -p Please help me. I haven't eaten in two days. Can you spare a little something to eat? Noah felt pity for the old man. So he went to a nearby shop and bought food, as well as a bottle of water for him. He gave the shopkeeper the money which he had been saving up to buy a new pencil box for himself. It wasn't long before he was walking up to the old man. Here, this is for you. Oh, thank you, dear boy. I thought I was going to starve to death. That is so kind of you. After eating the food and drinking some of the water that Noah had kindly brought him, he began to feel better and turned a proud gaze upon Noah. I've been searching for a kind-hearted person for a very long time. I do believe that my search ends today. Noah was confused when he heard this, so he asked the old man politely. What do you mean? The old man reached into the satchel he was carrying and pulled out an antique box. He looked solemn and reverent as he slowly opened it to reveal its contents. Inside rested a very old pencil which was shining as a bright little star. Noah was astonished by this sight. Suddenly, the old man abruptly closed the rusty lid, handing it to Noah, and says to him, Noah, yes, I know your name, for I am a wizard. I have been on a very long quest, seeking out a boy such as yourself would be willing to put aside their own desires in order to help others. Now you can help others with this magic pencil. Just draw whatever you wish and it will appear in before you instantly. Oh wow! Thank you kind wizard! Now I can help people in need whenever I want. This is great! Thank you so much! Just remember these two things. Don't tell this secret to anyone, or else they may steal it from you. And secondly, if you need my help at any time, you can just draw a picture of me, and I will be there in an instant. Don't worry, wizard! I will remember your instructions! Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, the wizard disappeared, and Noah excitedly continued his journey home. 
Noah couldn't wait to try out his magic pencil. So he draws a cake, and presto, it was instantly in front of him, sitting on a silver platter. The next day, he started to help each and every person he could find that needed something or other. He was walking down the road when he saw an overworked bellhop from a local hotel trying unsuccessfully to carry an overabundance of heavy and awkwardly shaped luggage. So, to help the young man out, Noah draws a baggage cart for him in order to ease his heavy burden. Then he saw a little girl who was barefoot and trying to sell matches, and no one seemed to care. But Noah did, and he proceeded to draw a basket of food along with some cozy slippers for her. After a while, he saw some homeless people shivering on the cold, hard street. So he drew some small but beautiful houses for them to call homes of their very own. That's how Noah chose to help the people around him. One day, when he was helping a poor man, the greedy and selfish mayor saw the kind and helpful boy. The mayor also saw how the little boy Noah was able to make all these things appear out of thin air with a simple yet magical pencil. The next day. The mayor ordered some policemen to arrest the boy for the illegal use of magic towards the unfortunate, because the law that the mayor had made only allowed the use of magic for the wealthy people of the land. The police found Noah using his magic pencil for all to see, magically helping those less fortunate than himself, and arrested him on the spot and dragged him off to present him to the mayor. He said. Noah, I saw how you helped those sick, hungry, hopeless, homeless, and poor people. Now you must help me. Draw me what I want: a tree that produces fruit of solid gold. Sir, with all due respect, I only help poor and needy people, and you're neither poor nor needy. It's not a request, Noah. I am ordering you to do so. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but I will not do this. Then be prepared for a severe punishment, you stupid boy. The mayor then demanded his servants to snatch the magic pencil from Noah. One policeman successfully did so and gave it to the mayor. Now the mayor began to draw a tree with golden fruit. It was a nice picture, full of colorful detail, but the magic within the pencil didn't respond to him. He then handed the writing utensil over to the policeman, who also tried, but failed as well, to conjure up anything from his stick drawing of a horse, which he had scribbled on a fresh sheet of paper. The policeman commented to the mayor, "I think the pencil won't take any orders from us, sir." It only recognizes Noah's hand, so only the boy can fulfill your wish, Mayor. The greedy mayor was furious. Noah, I'm asking you for the last time: Are you going to draw me golden fruit tree or not? Choose your words wisely; they may be your last. Noah was a brave boy, but at this point. He only wanted to end this whole fiasco, so he said he would draw something, and the mayor handed the boy the magic pencil. The next thing Noah draws is the picture of an old man on the piece of paper, and the wizard who had given the clever and kind boy the magic pencil came to rescue Noah. As soon as he appeared, the old man turned those policemen into cats, and he said. Don't you dare try to misuse the magic of this pencil for your own greedy endeavors, Mr. Mayor. Otherwise, you will be the next one who will lick his own tail. The mayor was greatly frightened and shivered with fear. Then the old man admonished the mayor not to be so greedy and selfish. The mayor also acknowledged his wrongs and apologized to Noah and the wizard. 
The very next day, the mayor rewarded Noah for his kind deeds and acts of helpfulness for the whole townspeople to see. And Noah continued to help those less fortunate and lived happily ever after. The End Why is Crow Black? Long, long ago, there used to be only white birds. Because of this, no one could guess which bird was of which kind. Now, you can imagine a white bird will be clearly visible on a green tree, right? This was a great help for the hunters and made their job much easier. It happened that all the birds got very scared. Sparrow, parrot, eagle, peacock, all the birds met at one place one day. All birds gathered to ask a special request of the magical elephant in charge of colors. The magical elephant understood their problem and said, Dear birds, great timing! I just happen to have some colors left over. Meet me after eight days and I will give you different colors. All the birds were excited and counted down the days. The birds gathered all their friends and all went to meet the magical elephant. First to come was the parrot, who said, Could you use your magic on me? I live in green trees, so therefore you could give me green color. With this color, I won't be easily visible by the hunters. But I like red chilies, so could you please give me red on my nose and mandible? He gave green color to the parrot, then, it said with a turn of the sparrow, she said, Sir, I live in the mud because my house is made of little twigs and sticks and rocks. Could you give me the same color? Okay. And the magic elephant approved the wish. Next, it was the eagle's turn. Sir, I live in the high mountains. Could you turn me that color? So... The wish was granted, and the bird became brown. Then came the beautiful peacock. He liked all the colors. Please, give me small, small amounts of all these colors. And with a little magic, the peacock suddenly got blue and green and yellow colors all over. It didn't take long for almost all the colors to be used up, even though the crow, the cuckoo, and the duck and heron birds had not come yet. The other birds called to them. Hey, come on! If you arrive late, all the colors will be used up. The crow and the cuckoo rushed to get there quickly, but almost all the colors were used up. Dear sir, please mix all these colors and give us whatever color it turns into. We know we're late, uh, so we'll just uh, take whatever you got available left. The magical elephant smiled. He knew what would happen if he mixed all the colors together. But that was the only option for them. And so they got to be black. Uh, oh well, yeah. Okay, when they saw whatever. the black crow and black cuckoo. But that cuckoo. was the only option for them. And so they got to be black. And you know what happened to the duck and the heron bird? They laughed and thought it was funny that they didn't get any bright colors. But the black crow and cuckoo laughed too. Because they knew that the white birds would always be white. So children, remember this. Don't be late for things or you might not get what you wished for. The End The Birds, Animals, and the Bat 
In a big, dense forest, animals lived under the trees, and birds lived on the trees. By now, you must know what birds and animals are. And yes, kids, there's also the bat who lived on the tree. All of them used to live happily together and never fought. But one day, something changed. When you live together, it's obvious you have different parts of the forest. The birds and animals started to fight each other. Animals with their upright tail and horns said, We are the best. So birds also moved their feathers and said, No, we are the best. And the war started. Once someone's ego is hurt, it ends up in a war, a quarrel, a fight, even bloodshed. The same story was about to be repeated here. A dangerous war started between the two groups. A lot of kill and noise was created. During this war, only the bat was quiet. Neither did he join the birds or the animals group. He was happily swinging on the tree. The birds were very annoyed with him. What is this? Despite being one of us, you're behaving like a stranger. You're only watching and not fighting. What does it mean such a big war is going on here and become a question of life and death? The animals are killing us and you're just sitting like a fool swinging here and there. Attack those animals! The leaders of the bird troop ordered the bat angrily. Then the bat replied, I am a fool because I don't attack the animals. If you have good eyesight, then look at my face. Do I have a bill? Have you ever seen a bird without a bill? You idiot. I am just fine. Bat said this and last on his own. And unhappy birds left from there annoyed with the bat. But within no time, the captain of animals came and said, Wow, you belong to us, great. Then you attack those worthless birds. Go and fight them and kill them. Then the bat turned towards the animal and said, Dear Captain, you are a fool to think I am an animal idiot. Look at my feathers. Have you ever seen an animal with such feathers? I am a bird, and how can I fight with them? You please go. Get lost. Now the animals turned angry on him. They also left him there. The war continued. Because of this war, everyone's work stopped. No one could do anything. They all were about to die soon. Then the birds and the animals sat together, discussed, talked, and thought of a solution. They then decided that the birds will live on the trees and the animals would live below the trees. As soon as it was decided, the birds flew and sat on the trees. They saw the bats swinging. They said, Hey, you, you're an animal. Get away from here or we'll kill you. Get lost. The poor bat got scared, fled from the tree. He fled down and sat near the animals. The captain of the animals group shouted, Hey, you, you're a bird. Understood. Go get from here. Get lost or we'll kill you. Now this time the bat was in real trouble. He could not live on trees and not even on land. No one helped him. There was no place for him to stay. He started living in dark holes. And since then till today, the bat lives only in the dark. The End The Voracious Rabbit There was a voracious rabbit, and he was always hungry. He used to eat a lot and sleep the day away. Always used to eat and eat and eat and eat all night, eat all day, but he was never satisfied with what he ate. Once, all the groups of rabbits rushed into the fields of green peace. Everyone ate their food quickly, but the hungry rabbit did not stop eating. One of the rabbits reminded him, 
Hey, you don't eat too fast, or the farmer of the field will come, and he will throw stones at us. Greedy Rabbit replied, Oh, please let me eat one more big bulb, and then we can leave. Hey, you're eating quickly. Look, the farmer of the fields is right over there now. He's coming towards us. Oh, it's okay. He's not reached the fields where we are. Please let me eat. I will eat one more big bulb, and then we can run away. In the meantime, the farmer arrived, and all the rabbits started shouting, Run, run, the farmer has arrived! Run, everybody! All the rabbits started running and leaping away. But the greedy rabbit could not even walk or jump, as he had eaten so much. All the rabbits were rushing and jumping out of the fields. But the greedy rabbit, he had eaten so much that when he tried to jump up, he fell on the tawny borders of the field. There were so many stones, and at that very time, the master of the field arrived with a big stick in his hand. He threw that stick at the rabbit, which injured the rabbit badly. Crippled while running, the rabbit somehow reached his home. He thought, Oh, saved! Thank you! He started walking slowly, but there was a fox behind him, and suddenly he started running towards the rabbit. All other rabbits got inside the house. The moment he entered the house, his big stomach was so heavy and swollen with the food he had eaten that he got stuck in the door. All the rabbits were pulling him from inside, and the fox had hold of his tail. It was like a big tug-of-war started. Hungry rabbits started yelling and crying, but the fox did not let go of his tail. At the end, the rabbit's tail got stuck in the fox's teeth, and the fox fell back with a loud noise. All the rabbits somehow pulled the greedy rabbit inside the house. The hungry rabbit, his greedy behavior, had put him in great danger. His life was changed, but he lost his tail. The End